There is no curative treatment for autosclerosis. Treatment options available are surgery or hearing aid fitting. In active cases, uh, a trial of sodium fluoride is also given. The role of medicine is only under debate, but sodium fluoride uh, can be given and that it is tablet tab sodium fluoride at a dose of 50 to 75 mg daily and uh, it can be given from 3 months to 2 years. The one function is it helps to hasten the maturity of the active focus and arrest further progression of the cochlear loss. And second, it has got an anti-enzymatic action. And which, action, uh, which enzyme? It uh, acts on the proteolytic enzymes and which are cytotoxic to the cochlea. So the second action is it has got an anti-enzymatic action on the proteolytic enzyme. And these proteolytic enzymes has got, which are cytotoxic to the cochlea. So anti-enzymatic action on the proteolytic enzymes. So these are the two um, functions of the uh, sodium fluoride. Sodium fluoride is contraindicated in pregnancy and lactation and in patients with kidney disease or nephritis and also in rheumatoid arthritis patients. So you have to uh, remember that there is medicines though not so much effective the one medicine which can be tried is sodium fluoride and the dose is 50 to 75 milligram daily from a period of 3 months to 2 years. Also know the function. Indications. What are the indications? I have already told. It is a, a cochlear autosclerosis and also active phase of stapedial autosclerosis. That you have to know. And you have to know the function. Indication I already told. And also contraindications. Okay. This modern transitorized hearing aids. Especially the programmable ones. And uh, give a very good result. Comparable to that of uh, stapedectomy. And sometimes better result than surgery in most of the patients. So in patients who are contraindicated for doing a surgery or they who are not willing for a surgery, you have to give the option of a hearing aid. And if you are planning the surgery also, uh, the informed consent should be very elaborate, elaborately written and the uh, option uh, of hearing aid should be well written in the informed consent. And informed consent should be signed by the patient and the doctor in the presence of a responsible bystander as witness. Okay, so the signatures should be of the patient, the doctor, treating doctor and also the witness who is a uh, responsible bystander. We won't do uh, surgery for all autosclerotic patients. And the treatment of choice is a, a stepidectomy or stepidotomy. And what are the indications of surgery? What are the indications of stepidectomy? This uh, audiogram is an indication. Okay, uh, what is that? An AB gap should be at least 15 to 20 dB. Okay, a conductive hearing loss of at least 30 dB. Here there is an AB gap of around 40 dB. So this is this an ideal candidate. There should be an AB gap of minimum of 20 to 25 dB. 20 dB AB gap. Minimum 15 to 20 dB AB gap. And conductive hearing loss should be at least 30 dB. Minimum 30 dB. And if PTA shows a conductive hearing loss of 30 dB, what will be the degree of hearing loss? Is it mild, is it moderate or it is severe? What is the degree? It should be, it will be moderate. So if it is moderate, the 256 as well as the 512, 24 Rini should be negative. So that is another indication. So uh, Rini negative with the 256 and 512, 26, uh, 512. Okay. And another uh, criteria is that the patient should have a good speech discrimination. What is what is a speech discrimination? In some cases of presby accuses, old age people will ask, eh, they will ask you repeat what what they will ask like that. And because they can they can't discriminate the words. 
So that should not be there in a case of uh, autosclerosis planned for surgery. So species discrimination should be good. So these are the indications for doing a stepidectomy. That is, uh, RINI will be, should be negative with uh, uh, 256 and 512. Then uh, minimum 30 dB he uh, hearing loss with a 15 to 20 dB AB gap and good speech discrimination. Okay, so after the indication, comes the chondra indications. What are the chondra indications? One absolute chondra indication is the only hearing ear. Okay, and another chondra indication is an active uh, autosclerosis or a cochlear autosclerosis, and that is a indication for a fluoride therapy. And in pregnancy and also extremes of age, there are also chondra. So one chondra indication is a absolute chondra indication is only hearing a ear. Then pregnancy. Uh, third, extremes of age. And fourth one, active autosclerosis or a cochlear autosclerosis. And also it is uh, contraindicated in certain professions like deep sea diving, then pilot etc. Where there is a constant change in the middle ear pressure which can lead to a, a expulsion of the uh, stupidity processes and later on they can go for perineal flesh and also sensory neural hearing loss. So after the indication comes the chondra indications. What are the chondra indications? One absolute chondra indication is the only hearing ear. Okay. And another contraindication is an active uh, autosclerosis or a cochlear autosclerosis and that is an indication for a fluoride therapy. And in pregnancy and also extremes of age, there are also contraindications. So one contraindication is an absolute contraindication is only hearing a ear. Then pregnancy, uh, third, extremes of age. And fourth one, active autosclerosis or a cochlear autosclerosis and also it is uh, contraindicated in certain professions like deep sea diving, then pilot etc. where there is a constant change in the middle ear pressure which can lead to a, a expulsion of the uh, stupidity processes and later on they can go for perineal flesh and also sensory neural hearing loss. So the contraindication, absolute contraindication is a what is absolute contraindication? It's the only hearing ear. And second, active autosclerosis, then professionals in like uh, deep sea divers and pilots, then pregnancy and also extremes of age. These are the five contraindications for a stepidic. The pre-op preparation of the patient is very much needed. You have to uh, tell every detail to the patient, get an informed consent and document everything in that. So first tell that a patient ideal for stepidectomy is also an ideal candidate for a hearing aid uh, fitting. And also you have to tell the uncertainties and the risk of operation. And this, all this should be uh, written as a full written disclosure and signed by the patient along with the a, a treating doctor in the presence of a witness and the witness should be a responsible bystander. All these three should sign under the uh, informed consent with a date and time. That is also very important. And uh, if the patient has no previous surgery and with this all these indications are there, there is 9 out of 10 uh, chance of a useful hearing improvement. Understand? If there is no previous history of surgery and there is all the indications are met with, then only there is 9 out of 10 uh, chances of a useful improvement of the surgery. And again, there is 1 in 100 cases, there is chance of a complete loss of uh, uh, hearing instead of a gain. 
and this also should be marked or this, al this also should be written and if after surgery there is a complete loss of hearing there is no chance of wearing a hearing aid at all and that has to be disclosed to the patient and that words should be there in the informed consent okay all the complications of the surgery should be mentioned in the uh, informed consent one is presence of dizziness first thing hearing aid fitting of hearing aid then chance of total uh, deafness then there is dizziness this dizziness can happen for few hours to days and in some cases it can uh, last longer and another one is taste because we can uh, there is the chance of cutting the caudative bony or there is traction on the caudative bony there can be a transient loss of taste to a permanent loss of taste that also to be uh, told to the patient and then there is chance of an unhealed perforation okay unhealed perforation of the tympanic membrane if it is there you have to go for a second sitting uh, do uh, there is need of a tympanoplasty okay and in less than one percentage of cases there is chance of facial palsy this happens in usually it happens in less than one percentage of cases even then there is a chance of facial nerve palsy and this facial nerve palsy uh, usually happens from five days to seven days it can be due to edema of the uh, fallopian canal or it can be due to an activation of the herpes infection which is inactively present in the corded tympani or in the facial nerve or it can be if you are using a laser there is chance of overheating of the nerve and there is also chance of descent or an aberrant facial nerve okay descent facial canal or aberrant facial nerve so edema or activation of herpes infection in the corded tympani or in the facial nerve or overheating if you are using laser and descent or a descent facial canal or an aberrant facial nerve in all these cases there is chance of facial nerve palsy usually between 5 days to 7 days and also in the um, informed consent you have to mention about the follow up there is need of an yearly follow up in case of uh, <coughs> autosclerotic patient okay and every year the patient should come and see the surgeon and if there is a drop of hearing or there is tinnitus vertigo or any uh, other symptoms of an endolymphatic eye drops the patient or a perilymph fistula the patient should immediately visit the doctor that also should be informed and if there is a perilymph fistula there will be a need of a second surgery or admission and the medications okay all these should be written in the Uh, informed consent and that should be signed by the concerned parties the surgery of choice is stepidectomy here i will describe you the basic steps of stepidectomy so in autosclerosis uh, the basic uh, problem is with the movement of the stapes isn't it stepidectomy so the incudostepidal joint is not moving properly so what should be the aim of treatment we have to remove the stapes and from the if this is a long process of ingress from the long process of ingress a process is is inserted into the oval window so that the uh, ossicles will move normally okay so that is the basic uh, principle or the basic idea of the surgery and we have to uh, uh, approach the stapes by doing a tympanotomy so a normal a tympanic membrane is there we have to elevate the tympanic membrane then approach the uh, stapes foot plate remove the stapes and do it, and put a uh, processes that is what we are doing in a stepidectomy and there are minor variations according to surgeon i'll explain you the basic principles or basic steps of stepidectomy okay 
This can be done under local anesthesia or general anesthesia. Local anesthesia is preferred because one, so the bleeding will be less and second, uh, we can assess the hearing after putting the processes intraoperatively. And if the patient is very anxious or not cooperative, it, can, uh, it should be done under general anesthesia. In uh, whatever the uh, type of anesthesia, first is infiltration. So, uh, before that, the position of the patient is supine with the operated side up. So, if uh, uh, doing on the right side, uh, keep the head towards the left so that the right ear will be upwards. And uh, this is the lying uh, position. And first is infiltration of 2% uh, lidocaine with the 1 in 10,000 adrenaline. Okay, cyclocaine, 2% cyclocaine with the 1 in 10,000 adrenaline. And where is it is, uh, infiltrated? It is infiltrated at the bony cartilaginous junction at the four quadrants. At the, uh, this is 12 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 3 o'clock and 9 o'clock position. So, 2% uh, lidocaine with 1 in 10,000 adrenaline uh, injected at the bony cartilaginous junction at the uh, 12, 6, 3 and 9 o'clock positions. And after that, an incision is put. Where will you put the incision? Here is the site of incision. So, uh, with a, a blade, put the incision. The first limb of the incision should be from 6 o'clock directly that is from the 6 o'clock position directly into the meatus. that is the first limb and second limb should start from here that is from the 12 o'clock uh, it should curve around and then it should uh, join with the first uh, limb of the which is at the 6 o'clock position and here, this should be minimum of 6 mm. Okay, so this approach is a permeative tympanotomy approach. Okay, so incision, the first limb is from the 6 o'clock directly into the meatus. And the second limb from the 12 o'clock curving around uh, posteriorly and uh, reaching the first incision. Okay, after that we have to elevate a tympanometer flap. From here, a flap is elevated like this. We have to elevate the flap from here. Okay. And when you elevate the flap, it will be like this. So, after elevation of the timberometer flap, what, uh, the, what you see here, that is, here is the tympanic uh, sulcus. So, the uh, flap is elevated. When you reach the annulus, Annulus is elevated from the tympanic sulcus and it is placed anteriorly and this is what you see there. So what is this? This is the chordate tympani and also a part of uh, uh, inguda stapedial joint will be seen. Along with this green color is the stapedius tendon. Okay, so the chordate tympani will be obscure in the view along with a part of uh, inguda stapedial joint and stapes and the rest will be obscured by the bone overhang okay so uh, depending upon the degree of overhang the visibility will be less or more so then what you have to do we have to remove this part of bone this overhang should be either it should be curated out using a micro curate or it should be drilled out so this uh, overhang should be drilled once you uh, remove the overhang the appearance will be like this here, this is a corded imbalance now directly overlying, uh, obscuring that. Along with that, there is a long process of ingress and the stapes is suprastructure with the foot plate and the stapedius tendon. So, next step is either you can cut the corded imbalance or you can retract the corded imbalance. The next, next, do the, if you can retract it, better retract it, retract the corded imbalance. So, cordotimani now is retracted <clears throat> and after that you check the mobility of the uh, ingodostapedial joint. Okay, this part, this mobility is tested with a micro probe or a uh, 
straight wick. And after confirming the stepedial autosclerosis, the next step is cutting the stepedius tendon. So this tendon is cut. So if the tendon is cut, then this uh, step is uh, superstructure and the foot plate will be seen very clear. So using cold instruments or using laser, uh, the superstructure is removed. Then after that what will you see? Uh, after cutting the uh, crura, removal of the superstructure. So uh, after this you remove the superstructure. Okay, so this will be the, only the foot plate will be visible. Uh, after that, penetrate the foot plate. Pen penetrate the foot plate, either with a pick or using a carbon dioxide laser or uh, with an argon or carbon dioxide laser or using a micro drill, uh, put a fenestra. And the size of the fenestra is usually 0.7 millimeters. This is the ideal size is 0.7 millimeter fenestra is made on the uh, uh, foot plate and after that the foot plate is uh, removed. Okay, removal of the foot plate. Then uh, after removal of the foot plate, we put a uh, piston is inserted from a piston is inserted from the uh, uh, long close the fingers into the foot plate and after this after uh, insertion of the uh, piston then uh, sealing the uh, oval window after that we will seal the oval window either using the vein graft uh, or the temporalis fascia graft or fat or trident perichondria we have to seal that and then we will replace the timberimetal flap so what were the steps done? We first uh, infiltrated, it can be done under local or GA according to preference. Then infiltrate with a lidocaine with a 1 in 10,000 adrenaline uh, infiltration is given. Then along with this we obtained a tissue graft that is from vein, temporalis fascia or uh, triangle perichondrium or the fat. After that exposure of the oval window that is by putting a timberimated flap and also by curating or drilling out the bony overhang this oval window then confirm the foot plate fixation by checking the mobility of the ingodostepedial joint after that uh, removal of the stepedius tendon and also removal of the sapis superstructure that is by which all uh, instruments either uh, fracturing using a sharp pick or with a micro crurotomy scissors or using a bar or an argon or a carbon dioxide laser then uh, creation of a fenestra and removal of the foot plate. The 0.7 mm diameter of the fenestra is ideal for using a 0.6 mm diameter processes. And after that, the uh, processes is placed, the malleus palpated, movement of the process is verified, then this stimulometer flap is uh, replaced and we uh, put uh, medicated gel form over the incision site and usually this is done as a uh, daycare surgery patient can be uh, discharged in the evening and uh, uh, put them on analgesics and advise to avoid straining and also blowing of the nose and also fly, uh, flying uh, flight should be travel by flight should be avoided and if they are discharging on the uh, evening, ask the patient to return on the next day and also weekly for the uh, first three follow-ups. Certain uh, special problems can happen during stepidating. One of such problems is a floating foot plate. Floating foot plate is 
while trying to mobilize or extract the food plate, it becomes mobilized and it floats in the vestibular fluid. Uh, we can try, uh, try to remove the food plate by making a tiny hole in the promontory end of the oval window, either using a uh, micro drill or with a uh, laser. If we cannot remove the floating foot plate, it can be left there and over the uh, foot plate a graft, that's a venous graft or the uh, facial graft can be uh, attached and over the graft this processes can be applied. Second is an obliterative autospongiosis. Okay, obliterative autospongiosis. In obliterative autospongiosis, the exact location of the foot plate cannot be identified. So we get an uh, idea about the foot plate by locating the crura and also the fallopian canal. With a drill or the laser, that uh, obliterative uh, area is obliterative foot plate area located and it is thinned down and until we get a blue line or the blue area. And over that the processes is applied. The third one is biscuit foot plate. During the types, we already uh, described about that. In biscuit type uh, foot plate, the foot plate surface is uh, thickened, but the annular ligament is intact. In that case, again, we have to thin down the uh, foot plate using a preferred methods are the drill or the laser. Then, uh, foot plate is removed uh, and uh, tissue graft applied and uh, piston is put over that. Okay. Fourth one is a decent or a prolapsed uh, facial nerve. Okay. Decent or a prolapsed facial nerve. If we are doing uh, on uh, first time, then uh, this can be anticipated and uh, uh, foot plate uh, removal and uh, uh, putting the process can be done without injuring the facial nerve. But there is high chance of injury to the facial nerve in a uh, revision surgery. In that cases, the uh, th this should be clearly, uh, the stance of this facial injury can be clearly documented in the uh, informed consent and high care should be taken to avoid an injury. Because in uh, revision cases, this uh, facial nerve can be embedded in the uh, and pulled down by the fibrous tissue over the oval window. So that should be uh, taken care of. Post-operative granuloma. Okay, so uh, granuloma chance is very high if we are using gel form during surgery. And uh, this happens within two weeks of surgery, post-operative period within two weeks. And the patient uh, will complain of a sudden deterioration of hearing and also there will be giddiness. And uh, this granuloma will be seen as a grayish uh, red mass in the posterior superior quadrant. Uh, uh, fix it, ingus and or malleus and also the uh, fracture of the long toes of ingus uh, can be encountered and in that cases if there is fixity of the malleus and ingus uh, that should be removed and a total or a partial ossicular replacement processes that is torque or the pork is uh, placed and sometimes there will be a round window closure in that case the, uh, you should never attempt to uh, try to open the wrong window because the results are very much disappointing and acute otitis media can happen and it is not of much problem and uh, you can avoid it or treat it by using and uh, giving antibiotics and another uh, complication is a during a special problem during surgery is a perilymph gusher okay that is important perilymph gusher Gush of perilymph. That's a rare but very alarming uh, problem. And uh, immediately at or at the moment you open the vestibule, it can be an alarming gush of perilymph. And that is due to an abnormal patency of the uh, cochlear aqueduct or the internal acoustic canal. What you have to do?
immediately elevate the head end of the patient and if the uh, intracranial pressure is reduced the uh, flow can be stopped and along with it put a tissue uh, seal uh, over the oval window opening along with the processes and uh, post operatively also the patient should be on complete bed rest with elevation of the head at 30 degree till the uh, mastoid dressing become dry for 24 hours. Uh, if the, uh, it's not getting relieved by that, uh, lumbar puncture, uh, lumbar drain should be kept. Okay, lumbar drain is needed. And uh, this belly lift gush, there is chance of patient going for a complete sensory neural hearing loss. And it is better. So, uh, in order to uh, find out the presence of an uh, abnormally wide or patent cochlear aqueduct or the internal acoustic canal, it is always better to go for an uh, high resolution CT scan of the general room before doing a step And uh, these are some of the special problems encountered. Then the complications I have already discussed along with the informed consent like uh, giddiness, facial palsy, etc.